Welcome to today's presentation where we'll discuss records, rewards, and risks of using this technology. I'm very happy to have Dara Perry, uh, Dr. Of course, Pat Franks, and Amitabh uh, here today to talk to us about blockchain and in records management. I hope the takeaway today for all of you is to get uh, not only an introduction to this, but also go into that 201 level, even 301 level uh, of the blockchain technology, but also be left with a lot of resources that are out. So we've got uh, Dara Hoffman. Uh, she's an incoming assistant professor and just recently completed her PhD, congratulations. Um, she uh, is a professor for the School of Information, San Jose State University. Um, also uh, with us is, and I'm sorry, Dara, you, you reside in British Columbia, correct? Yes, okay. Just south of Vancouver. South of Vancouver, excellent. Uh, also, we have uh, Perry J. Swift. Uh, she's the University Records Manager at The Ohio State University. Uh, even though I come from the state of Michigan, uh, I'm happy to have her here. Uh, and I'm a Notre Dame fan, so it really doesn't bother me <laughs> in regard to the Michigan, uh, Michigan State, Ohio State rivalry, although it seems like Ohio State is definitely, uh, at least in the sport of football, American football, they've uh, had us, had our number. Uh, of Very course, true. Dr. Pat Franks, uh, professor and MARA program coordinator, uh, School of Information at San Jose State University. Uh, she's also an author of uh, Records Information Management. Her second edition book uh, was recently released. Uh, there is a review on IG Guru uh, for those who are interested in picking up a copy of her book. Um, and who is very, she's very much responsible for putting a lot of this content together and will later reference the, the white paper. And uh, Amitabh uh, Shivas, Shivastav, uh, yeah. VP of Operations and Governance at Helix. Um, and I, I, I know I skipped over Perry, referenced Ohio, you live in Ohio. Uh, Amitabh, you live in uh, Toronto, if I'm not mistaken, correct? No, I live in, uh, in Ottawa, Canada, so um, a little bit more uh, east of, uh, of Toronto, kind of midway between Toronto and Montreal. Ottawa, Canada, that's Canada, right. Midway, yeah. Capital, yeah. Sorry, my, my American nope. is showed there. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay, no problem. I apologize. So, blockchain technology, industry use cases, RIM challenges, and the unknowns, risk audit and considerations are going to be covered today. Um, I'm listed as the moderator, but I'm not really going to moderate anything. Uh, each of the presenters has a uh, has a, a presentation they're gonna give that's a short presentation on these sections. And um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we are going to be uh, taking questions at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. So, so if you could please uh, hold your questions till then or type your questions in the chat box and then we'll, we'll answer them at the end and we'll have that specific uh, speaker, presenter and or others chime in. So without further ado, We can go ahead and advance the slide and uh, have Dr. Dara start. Could take it away. So good morning, everyone. I get the honor of starting and explaining what blockchain is. And so um, this is a 25,000 feet view. There are people who write lengthy papers full of math equations and pseudocode about every tiny technical aspect of different types of blockchains. That's not me. I am your, you know, classic liberal arts fluffy type. And so we'll be talking, I'll talk about it from a very high level, what this is and how it works. So this is the Interpares, which is an archival research um, group definition. The ISO is working on their standard for blockchain and that will probably become the accepted definition, but it's not out yet. But blockchain is basically a trusted immutable uh, ledger of transactions that's um, decentralized and distributed. So I'm gonna kind of talk about each of those aspects in turn. So let's start with ledgers. I think uh, most of us who are archivists, records managers, we're all familiar with ledgers. Even people who aren't necessarily in the archival field still have a vague sense. A ledger is just basically a collection of related transactions. And that related transactions part is important because once you start throwing the whole kitchen sink into a ledger, 
you lose that sense of connection, you lose the sense of relatedness, and it becomes a lot harder to make the ledger serve its purpose, which is um, one of the problems with blockchains that try to do too much, is that you lose the ability to uh, form the connections between the record and to maintain what archivists would call the archival bond. Uh, so we've got a ledger. So how is this different from any other ledger? Uh, this picture, you'll see almost anyone who talks about blockchain present, but it's not a blockchain picture. It actually comes from uh, a RAND study back in the 1960s or 50s about nuclear war. And the, what the picture represents is how we can make communication systems more robust in the event of a nuclear attack. And so you see the first picture here on the left, that is a centralized system. All you need is one nuke to take everybody down in that way. Then you have a decentralized system uh, where there are more, more than one controlling nodes, but you still only need to take seven down. Whereas when you have a, de a distributed network like you have on the right, the idea is that all that redundancy, having all these different nodes in communication with one another leads to a lot of robustness and it makes it a lot harder to destroy the system just by destroying one, two, or even seven nodes. And so you see the same idea at play behind the distributed network in the blockchain, because by having lots of nodes in contact with one another, you, ha you can't just take down the whole system by taking down one node. And so, for example, you see people who advocate the use of blockchains to prevent censorship. This is part of the reason, even if um, repressive regime A takes down all the nodes in their country, um, the resistance can still be communicating using nodes outside the country, for example. And so this uh, distributed network is a really important part of how blockchains are built. Now then, a big buzzword in the blockchain world is immutability. Immutability is the idea that once something goes onto the blockchain, it can't be changed. And the reason the blockchains are supposed to be immutable is because the way that they work is basically, it, I have a transaction. Uh, I'm going to buy something from Dr. Pat. And so um, before that transaction gets written on the ledger, uh, someone, let's say Andrew, is going to check to make sure that Pat has the 20 bucks and I have, or I have the 20 bucks that I'm offering Pat and Pat has the shirt in her inventory. The um, transaction then gets verified, it gets written onto the, onto a block. And then you get a block of 10 transactions. And so each of those transactions has a fingerprint taken. And every single fingerprint, and the, that fingerprint is actually an alphanumeric code that's done uh, through an algorithm. But you have a block with 10 fingerprints. The very first fingerprint of the next block is going to be all 10 of those hashed together into a handprint. The hash is the name for the fingerprints. And so if I change something in block one, if I change the fingerprint for mine and Pat's transaction, then the fingerprint in block two is going to be wrong as well. And so that's the idea behind blockchain immutability is that each uh, block is chained together with that previous hash, with those previous fingerprints. Now then, blockchains are theoretically immutable to certain attacks, like a 51% attack for the Bitcoin blockchain. If I control 51% of those nodes that I showed you in the distributed chain, then I can change all of the transactions that I want and no one can check me and no one can catch me. So I prefer to say that the blockchain is highly tamper resistant as opposed to um, um, immutable. That said, it's a highly evolving uh, space. The, there are lots of different types of blockchains and their technology. the technology is advancing rapidly. But as it stands right now, I would say most blockchains are tamper resistant. And tamper resistance is both a strength and a weakness because, of course, um, if you make an error, it can be very challenging to correct the record if the record is on chain. You basically have to create a new record. So it's an interesting space for us as, uh, as researchers, especially as archivists. 
Now, the disintermediation, this is one of the really interesting things about the blockchains, and uh, this is specifically in what you would call a public permissionless blockchain is where this is the strongest. And that means it's a blockchain that anyone can use and that no one has special permissions, different rights on. Uh, there are other types of blockchains where you do have, for example, have people with certain rights like voting rights or uh, where the blockchain is only accessible to certain people. We see those, for example, in medical research or um, in certain financial areas where we want higher degrees of protection. But the idea of disintermediation is that instead of asking a lawyer or a banker or some trusted party, some trusted entity to, take, to uh, intervene in transactions, the blockchain itself does it. So in the Bitcoin blockchain, you have a consent mechanism uh, whereby people can mine and whoever solves the cryptographic puzzle first gets to check mine and Pat's um, transaction to see uh, if it's good. And it all happens without direct human intervention. That's the idea behind disintermediation. But of course, disintermediation, again, you see this Janus-like coin throughout blockchain technology because if there's no intermediary, then who's responsible if things go wrong? The blockchain is this interesting thing, especially the public permissionless blockchains, that seems to be owned by everyone and no one, which comes to, makes it a very fascinating um, space for, uh, from a legal perspective, which is by, by past life, before I came into archives. And so where does liability fall when something gets messed up? How, who's responsible, for example, um, if a court finds that there is personally identifiable information or incorrect information on a blockchain that needs to be redacted in some way, who's responsible for making that happen? If you don't have any particular intermediary to point to, someone who's legally responsible, it's a really challenging question to deal with. And we see this, I'm sure, uh, I think uh, Pari's going to talk about this later, but with the new general data protection regulation out of Europe that the huge privacy regulation that came out two years ago, there's a lot of big questions about how to manage blockchains in the existing legal frameworks. So this is basically a nice picture from uh, NIST about how it actually works. So the hash there is the fingerprint I was talking about. Uh, the algorithm runs over the transaction. If you change a bit, you change the hash. It's um, 256 alphanumeric characters. A timestamp is exactly when it happened. A nonce is a little bit of nonsense. Um, and then, of course, the hash is the block data. And you see that each of these blocks is chained together with the hashes from the previous blocks, and hence the clever name of blockchain. So really one of the big things that blockchain is meant to deal with is this question of trust. Uh, the idea behind the blockchain in Satoshi, uh, not, uh, Satoshi's white paper, which was only in 2009, which might seem very long ago to some of you, but it's quite recent for um, in terms of technology. Um, the idea was to create a cryptocurrency that could be um, used between parties who don't know each other, don't trust each other, uh, without third-party intervention. And so it's really a big question of trust. We can't trust people, so we're going to trust the technology because, you know, there's this idea that technology doesn't lie, technology isn't biased, technology doesn't have interests. And so you see this idea, too, even in, um, in, in the archival field, you know, we have this idea of neutral third parties, trustworthiness, blah, blah, blah. And so the idea becomes that People can't be neutral, but maybe a machine or mathematics can be. So does that mean all of our trust problems are solved? <laughs> nope, not so much. Um, what, what it comes down to, and you're seeing this a lot, for example, in um, the research about uh, accountable AIs, for example, to bring another technology in, is that we have a lot of problems with trust and with um, bias and with neutrality that still haven't been dealt with, even with the blockchain. That said, it's a fascinating technology with lots of possibilities that I will now turn it over to uh, my colleagues to explain and to discuss. Thank you. This slide, real quick, is uh, it's a ontology of records trustworthiness that Dr. Victoria Lemieux, who uh, heads a blockchain at the University of British Columbia, uh, based on 
uh, an ontology of trustworthiness that Interparis came up with. Because when we talk about trusting records, we talk about three things, accuracy, reliability, and authenticity. And while blockchain is fantastic at ensuring the integrity of the records, for example, if you're hashing records that happen off the chain, there's nothing that a blockchain can do to make those records reliable. They were either reliable or not before they got hashed to the chain. And so it's just an example of all the work that still needs to be done in the space with this technology to meet our needs for uh, reliability and trustworthiness. Excellent. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, industry use cases, and we're on slide number one for you. Go ahead. Excellent. Okay, so the first challenge, I think, in deciding if a blockchain is uh, the right solution for you uh, is to take a look at some of the use cases, and we see a number of use cases that are here, uh, including credit history, elections, healthcare, and so on. So this matrix you may have seen quite a bit, and it explains uh, the questions that you have to ask yourself and then answer if you're an organization to decide if you think the blockchain is the right solution. On the left-hand side, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but there are three questions that are important. Do you need a shared database for multiple users? Do you need it to be immutable, time stamped, uh, and uh, keep a log of all entries? And do you have trust issues among the users? Uh, if all of those answers or any of them are no, you might want to think about perhaps finding a way to use a traditional database. But if those answers are yes, then you want to move on to the right-hand side of that matrix where you ask yourself, will any of the data stored need to be modified or deleted in the future? You heard um, Dara talk about the GDPR and the fact that some information may have to be deleted. Uh, will personal and or sensitive data be stored uh, that you want to be sure is not uh, revealed? Uh, will big data be stored? Uh, if any of those answers are yes, you might want to consider other solutions, but it doesn't mean the blockchain is not right. It may mean that you would store a hash of the data on the chain, and then you would store the data itself off the chain. If the answers are no, then it's pretty evident that the blockchain may be right for you. So I want you to uh, keep this in mind. Uh, it's a quadrant and uh, I'm taking a look at two different issues here. One is uh, the public and private modality. Um, who can write or create on the blockchain? All right, uh, is it just certain people who've permission? If so, then it would be private. But if it's anybody out in the public, uh, then of course it's going to be public. But what about the reading and consuming? Is that different? Uh, it may very well be. It may be that only certain people can read the information that's on the blockchain, or everybody can. Uh, I want you to think about this uh, acronym that databases uh, uh, can be used to describe a database. It's CRUD. Have you heard that? C-R-U-D. It means create and read and uh, 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 modify, um, update by updating or deleting. So you have your C-R-U-D, create, read, update, and delete. Um, that's a database, but a blockchain can't do all of that. A blockchain can only do the create uh, and the read. That's all you're thinking about here. So that's the difference between the two different types of technologies. Keep this in mind. Maybe draw yourself a little rectangle with four blocks, and then I'm going to uh, go quickly over four different use cases, and then I'm going to see if you could put them in the right quadrants there. So the first use case is e-voting, and I thought this would be interesting because we're all concerned about voting right now with the presidential elections coming up. And West Virginia back in 2018 tried uh, blockchain voting in uh, their midterm elections. They used VOTAS, which is a mobile voting uh, system platform. And uh, they thought it was successful, as did an independent group that uh, took a look at the results. However, recently, uh, there was another study that uh, said maybe this uh, can be violated in some way, not necessarily the blockchain layer, 
but other aspects of it. So they're not sure that they're going to be using that for the presidential election. Uh, but what the idea was there is that it would be really good for our military personnel stationed overseas. They would be able to use their mobile devices in order to register and in order to vote. Denver used it for their municipal election as well. And um, they thought it was quite successful, as did an independent uh, study uh, show that it was very useful for them. Uh, that was the second pilot using the same system, VOTAS. Uh, now, what about uh, blockchain for the presidential election then? Well, uh, I like this uh, little bit of a headline here. Does Trump know that blockchain is nominating him? What they really mean is that two states, uh, Utah and Arizona, use blockchain to select the delegates who are going to go to the convention in August and nominate President Donald Trump for his re-election bid. So the third uh, is gambling. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you enjoy going to casinos. Uh, my husband does, so I, I frequent casinos. And uh, the idea there is that uh, everybody, if they're of age, should be able to gamble to visit a casino. Uh, but there's always a question about the house payoff. You know, is, is that really legit? What's happening behind the scenes? And the same thing goes with our quick draw or whatever the states may be doing for lotteries. We want to know what's the percentage payout. Uh, well, blockchain can be used for gambling. And you see here that uh, it even can be integrated with virtual reality. So you have the whole feel of going into a casino to do your gambling. And we see a couple of uh, examples of blockchain technology used for gambling or gaming right here on this slide. So that's our third example. And then our fourth. Uh, well, actually, I guess our third, supply chain. Uh, in the wake of the romaine, do you remember this, the E. coli scare where uh, leafy green romaine uh, lettuce was the cause of uh, E. coli? And uh, they were trying to trace this back to the source. You know, what happened uh, along the way uh, that would cause this problem? And where did this uh, lettuce come from? It's very difficult to figure that out when um, you have to trace back the supply chain. So uh, Walmart decided that they were going to uh, experiment with blockchain technology in order to uh, follow the chain of supply for their leafy green vegetables. And uh, they did a two-year pilot, and as part of it, they tried to uh, trace back the source of sliced mangoes, of all things, and it took seven days for Walmart employees to locate the farm in Mexico that grew the fruit. So seven days after the first thought that they should trace this back. However, using IBM's blockchain, uh, they were able to trace this back in a matter of seconds. Big difference. So now you would be able to know exactly which greens were contaminated, where they came from, and if customers knew this, they would be able to check too uh, to see if they were in danger or if they had to discard what they had purchased. So the last one is law enforcement. So blockchain uses um, Blockchain can be used for law enforcement, but for a lot of different reasons. I'm just showing one here, but it could be used to spot crypto crime, to standardize distributed crime reports, to secure interoperable interagency data sharing. Uh, the illustration that is used here is that blockchain can be used for uh, keeping track of evidence. So a tamper-proof chain of evidence uh, for law enforcement. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're using Lenovus, a, a different type of blockchain solution in order to uh, provide this service. So, okay, we get back to this uh, little quadrant again, and uh, uh, we can think about the four different examples that I gave you. So let's think about that very first one and see if you were correct. In voting, we want everyone to vote, right? Uh, but really, does everybody see that vote? I don't think so. Uh, even as far as the documents that were used, if you were using paper in order to vote or the OCR uh, scans or whatever it may be, we have election officials that are privy to that information and just give us the results. So where would our voting 
uh, come into play on this uh, quadrant? All right, so it would be public for writing, but it would be closed for reading, okay? The next example that we had was the gambling. So I mentioned everybody should be able to gamble if they're of age and if they would like to do that. But at the same time, everybody would like to make sure that uh, they could see the payoff stats, that they know that the system is transparent. So what does this mean as far as creating and reading the information Gambling. All right, so in this case, writing is public. We can all take part in this if we'd like. And then reading is also open so that we can see the type of statistics, the payout that is happening with the gambling uh, that's going on. All right, the next example was the supply chain with those leafy green uh, vegetables uh, going from seed all the way to your table. Uh, in this case, only those that are involved in the supply chain should really be writing to it. So the distributors, the growers, whoever that may be. But all of us would like to know where the heck that came from if there is a scare. We want to be able to find a way to trace back what we have purchased and the grocers would like to do the same. Uh, so so that they can see if this is part of that contaminated batch or not. So there you go, your supply chain is private as far as writing, but it's open as far as reading. And that leaves us with the last quadrant, uh, which is going to be our law enforcement. When I think law enforcement, I think secret, right? We want to write uh, and make sure our records are secure. Not everybody can see them. And at the same time, we want to only have certain permissioned people read the information that's there. So I'm wondering how you all did, if you were able to figure that out, and I want to thank you for uh, your attention. And now I'd like to turn this over to Pari Swift, uh, the University Records Manager at Ohio State. And Pari, go ahead. <clears throat> Thanks, Pat. Well, uh, one of the questions that I saw come in uh, was how each of us got involved in blockchain. And I got involved in blockchain because uh, it, as a records manager, I feel like I needed to know enough about it in order to be able to have the conversations and be involved in the conversations with the IT teams and other teams involved in it. And I think that I soon realized that I didn't understand it at all, and what I thought I understood was wrong. Uh, so that's how I got involved, so that I made sure that I, I knew enough about it to have those conversations, that I was able to clear up what I was misunderstanding about blockchain, and that is why I have the records and information management challenges and unknowns. Because currently, while we're starting to understand blockchain, we don't know much about how records management is going to work with blockchain, uh, nor do we have a lot of case law on how blockchain is going to stand up uh, to legal standards and challenges. So, uh, Records and information management uh, teams are often not consulted when it comes to IT projects, not just blockchain projects, all IT projects. Uh, so it may be that we're not even going to be aware when our organization is considering blockchain. Um, however, system design can really impact uh, the records management functions within blockchain, whether it's private, whether it's public, understanding where documents uh, related to the transactions on a blockchain are stored is very important, especially if they're not on the blockchain, if they're somewhere else. Um, so records management should not just be a part of the project team working on just the system design, but it should also be represented in change management. Uh, change management is also one of those functions that's often led by IT, when in fact it's the records professionals that have a deep understanding of how people's records creation and records keeping practices are going to be impacted by whatever the new system is. Um, if you can go ahead and click. So um, not only, oops, can we go back? I'm sorry, I have animations okay. in mind. It's okay. So specific blockchain projects are often pre-decided without consulting records management on whether the records or the data or the transactions are an appropriate use or whether blockchain is an appropriate use for those things. Uh, oftentimes the project and the solution 
go hand in hand. Somebody is going to come and say, we want to do this project using this solution. And minds are made up before that analysis even takes place. Uh, and then unfortunately, sometimes records management is seen as throwing up roadblocks to these projects. We're slowing it down. Um, but really what we want to do is make sure that, that it's going to work not just for the business unit's present functions, but that we're going to be able to comply with um, records and information management laws. Um, so one thing in particular, we want to make sure, as, as was already mentioned, that uh, personally identifiable information is not held within the blockchain. So while the basic definition of a record is the same across the board, whether it's in ARMA or SAA's dictionary or other standards um, or even state and federal law, the components that make up what a record is can vary across jurisdictions. And so that's something that we have to deal with. Um, we have to figure out, you know, in our jurisdiction, is metadata considered a part of the record or a separate record in and of itself? Uh, do multiple documents or pieces and parts make up a single record? Or is each one of those a different record? And again, this is all going to depend on the definition of record in your jurisdiction. Um, and can those different portions have different records management requirements? Uh, I have spent my entire 20-year career in government at all levels. So accessibility is something that's incredibly important to me, whether it's um, FOIA or public records requests or even e-discovery um, and just discovery. So in the case of blockchain, are those pieces and parts, are they stored in, in other places? And how does that implement disposition? How does it affect how we get access to those records? Um, you know, we have to take into consideration, is there an encryption key that um, certain people need to have, whether it's the attorneys in your litigation division um, or anybody who's responding to public records requests? Are we going to have that encryption key? Are we always going to have it? And then there's the lack of classification which in, with, within blockchain. Are we going to easily be able to locate and provide access to the information that's being requested. And again, this goes back to how are specific state or federal laws when it comes to access worded. Uh, each of those could be different. And then do we have the ability to redact if we need to redact in a situation like that? Is blockchain going to give us that ability? So uh, one of the challenges in records management and blockchain is retention and defensible disposition. Uh, we want, you know, we always learn in records management, we want to make sure that we get rid of records per retention schedules. Uh, and sometimes we, there's a liability if we don't. Um, it can be a liability to our organization or um, it could be uh, going against certain laws or regulations. Um, you know, one of the things that has already come up is GDPR and the right to be forgotten. Uh, people have a right to say, I don't want that information out there about me. Are we going to be able to go in to blockchain and delete that information? Um, privacy laws now often require a minimal retention. We used to say, or a maximum retention. I'm sorry, that's, that's incorrect on my slide. We used to say retention's a minimum. You have to keep it at least this long. But now privacy laws are saying you really shouldn't have it any longer than you need it for the original purpose for which you collected that information or created that record. And we haven't been able to determine yet with blockchain, are we going to be able to get rid of that when we need to? And then um, there's the whole issue of archival survivability. Um, one of those issues is just doing appraisal. Blockchain presents a completely different scenario for doing appraisal than archivists are used to. Archivists are used to uh, having, having a group of records and having a context behind it and a classification scheme and creating that in order to make it available to researchers. And now with blockchain, we're unable to separate records out without invalidating the rest of the chain. And then we lose that integrity that is such a big, important thing when it comes to blockchain. Uh, the other issue with archival survivability is simply the long-term survivability of records on a blockchain. If they do need to be kept permanently, if they really are historical in nature or provide that long-term legal value, um, 
are we going to be able to access these into the future and for how long? Uh, we're going to need to have access to that encryption key and not lose it. I mean, we've heard stories on um, cryptocurrency where people have lost their key and they've lost their money, basically. Um, we haven't looked into a transfer protocol that I'm aware of really. How are we going to get records from the blockchain to the archives? Are we going to send a node to the archives? Are we going to send all the nodes to the archives? Are we going to try to get it out of blockchain? Um, which often at this point, there are a lot of um, proprietary blockchains, as with any other type of electronic record. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about blockchain is, is decentralized. Is that a positive or a negative when it comes to getting these records to the archives and making them available? And finally, of course, there's the cost. When we are talking about uh, a chain that keeps growing, that's never deleted, that is using multiple nodes, from all over the place that comes at a huge cost uh, as far as preservation, as far as the power to keep it up and running. Um, and I think that there are, are more and more studies being done on that aspect of blockchain. Now, I will say, because sometimes it, it does sound like I, I might be uh, squarely in the con side of blockchain, uh, that the more I do study it, the more there is some good that, that can come out of it. I was on a presentation recently, and they were talking about um, identity management. Uh, particularly, we, we were talking about identity management with, say, student records. You know, I have a daughter that's going off to college. She needs her high school transcripts in order to, to prove that she's taken certain classes to get into college. And one of the things that I realized is that um, when it comes to archival preservation, if we can use blockchain for um, identity management, she doesn't necessarily need to have that copy of the transcript to send a copy of the actual transcript to a whole bunch of different places. That preserves the original, and it means that there's less copies of that information about my daughter out there, because all they really need to do is use that blockchain and those transactions to prove that she did, in fact, earn this particular degree in these areas. There are some legal challenges that come with this as well. Um, Records keeping laws are not keeping up with evolving technology. That's not just a blockchain issue. Uh, that's just a, an issue in general. And so we are trying to take modern technology such as blockchain and squeeze it into laws that were written a couple decades ago and maybe only tweaked here and there. And it doesn't fit how we do business anymore. Uh, as I mentioned, defining the record and defining the pieces and the parts of a record is, is a challenge that hasn't, hasn't been dealt with yet. Um, and then what's considered destruction? Does it have to be a complete destruction? Or can we simply uh, destroy the encryption key so that the record is unreadable? This is another thing that hasn't been tested in courts yet. Uh, another consideration is, are the nodes in different jurisdictions? And could that present challenges to legal retention requirements, especially if the requirements are different in those different jurisdictions? Um, and who takes ownership? When it comes to litigation, um, records could be retained that hold an organization liable in litigation. If we're not regularly deleting on blockchain, because it's not that easy to do, uh, we have to understand that some of that information could be harmful to us. So that's a consideration to take into account when you're thinking about what to put um, on blockchain, is if we can't get rid of this, is this going to come back and hurt us in any way? And then, as I mentioned, there are increased costs, but there are also increased costs and resources for e-discovery. And then finally, privacy law uh, limits the distribution of information. So here we're talking about a system where the same information is repeated on nodes across the country, possibly across the world, and yet that seems to be in conflict with these privacy laws that want to limit the distribution of information. So there are some questions that as a records manager you can pose in this process. Uh, first question, simple question, what's the retention period? And then following up with, are there potential liabilities if we don't destroy it for retention? Usually we're coming up with a retention period because we should be getting rid of information when that expires. Um, and then another question is, are there multiple rep record series represented in a single blockchain? Next. Is there a benefit to recording a transaction? 
or is that transaction part of another record or is it a standalone record? So is it just the transaction that's a record or are there records stored elsewhere that um, that transaction reflects? I also ask who needs access to the data and are these persons going to change throughout the life cycle of the record? What tools are they going to need and how are we going to pass those tools on from person to person? So what are the pros and cons of using blockchain for a particular project? Are there existing solutions that are already sufficient? I think we go back to one of Pat's first slides uh, in thinking about that, and she had that nice little flow chart there. Finally, what are the costs, um, and do the benefits of using blockchain justify the costs of it? A couple more questions. Are there privacy and security concerns? Uh, people talk about the blockchain being wonderful for security, but at the same time that it's great for securing the information, is it in conflict with some privacy laws? And finally, will our organization have control over where the nodes are located? And that comes down to what are the laws in your jurisdiction or in the jurisdiction uh, where these nodes could potentially be located? So those are just a few of the questions, and I think that the more we start to uh, use blockchain and learn and understand it, you know, we're going to come up with some more questions and we're going to be able to refine this list of questions. So uh, thank you very much for that. And I am going to turn it over to Amantav Shrivasta. Great. Hi. Uh, thank you, Perry, uh, for the introduction. I've got a bit of feedback here. Hopefully that's better. All right. Yes. Hi. So my name is uh, Amitabh Shrivasta. Um, I'll be speaking a little bit about the risks that a new technology presents. And of course, new technology and its benefits versus, uh, versus the, the, uh, the, the risks. So obviously you've seen some of the benefits and certainly it's um, a lot of new ways of doing things using blockchain technology. So some of the risks that I'll be speaking about are actually discussed a little bit more in detail in the white paper that um, Pat was referring to, which is understanding blockchain's roles and risks in trusted systems. So we're all familiar with the technology S-curve and obviously the new technology tries to solve a problem out there. But obviously as with any new, new technology, you know, it, there's some hype around it. And of course there's gonna be uh, improvements as the technology moves from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And so therefore any new technology requires a cost benefit analysis. So as the technology moves through its improvement phases, you know, it'll have its early adopters, you'll go through your a first generation of technology, second, and so on and so forth. So during the improvement, there's obviously a lot of hype. You know, they're trying to sell solutions to uh, problems that might not exist out there, and or they're trying to look for problems that may not exist. So it's important to really cut through the hype and to understand the risks versus the benefits and determine if, in fact, there's a problem that needs to be solved. So the approach. Um, that we that we took is really to look at the risks from uh, from four different levels, so four so four risk assessment levels, uh, really moving from a high level, which is the um, um, you know the kind of strategic risk. Should I use the blockchain? Then you get into your level two, which is a little bit more detail, which is around design. Then of course the implementation, and then more detail is really the the operational risks. And so here, as you can see, the, uh, the four risks are laid out in a kind of quadrant circle. You can see the little circle going from strategic all the way to operational. But one thing to look at really is uh, the design risk because the design risks will really um, help define the scope of the potential solution, assuming you've decided to use a blockchain solution. So that's really important. And going back to some of the other speakers um, that I've spoken about, it's important to understand the implications of information risk management and the strategy uh, for that risk management as you consider the design solution. So the next level, which is the design risk, we identified uh, seven key risks uh, from governance all the way around to, the, to, to project planning. And I'll certainly get into these a little bit more, but what's important to understand is that there are a lot of questions that both affect you know, the technology um, that also affect the, the use of the technology more from processes and, of course, in how you're going to actually move forward in terms of implementing a project. So let's look at some of these uh, design risks in a little bit more detail uh, with respect to implementation risks. So what you have here are the seven risks. So we're at level two. So obviously level one was the 
blockchain solution. So that's a strategic risk whether or not to actually move forward. Then you've got your design risk. And you can see the design risks have a, a number of implementation risks underneath. So what we have here is really a risk breakdown structure or RBS for short. Uh, so if people are, are, are in project management, uh, you will be kind of familiar with this. And so what this lays out is a hierarchical structure of the risks in terms of how they can either percolate upwards or you can look at risks from high level and move downwards to a little bit more detail. So of course, you know, this refers back to the four, four risk levels that we talked about a couple of slides back. Uh, so, you know, for example, you have governance, which is really around you know, selecting the, the blockchain solution, um, providing some oversight and compliance, of course, records management. You get into some of the operational structures um, and how to manage and monitor the blockchain solution. You have to look at the organization's reputation if the solution uh, fails or, or, or other things happen. Uh, there, of course, is the technical architecture and the different options there. And we've talked a little bit about that as well. You do get into areas around legislation and regulation. Um, personal information, we've talked about that. Data residency, which was kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. You also are looking to, into the IT operations, really from a data management we've talked about to how you, how you defend the chain, um, cryptography. So a number of areas from an IT perspective. And then, of course, you get into the project planning. So many of your regular project management activities, you know, your business objectives, your business case. And we all know many times that these are not um, done properly, sometimes in the rush to get a solution moved out, sorry, pushed out. So certainly um, that, um, does require some project manager oversight. So let's maybe walk through um, uh, two examples and then we can look at some of the level for operational risks. So let's maybe look at the uh, governance. So that of course had four um, implementation risks. So here are some of the questions that um, what should be considered, you know, such as um, do you have the electronic records for your mission critical digital assets, you know, uh, do you have a large volume of digital content? So these are some of the questions one should ask. There are, could, could potentially be more questions, but this is a way to kind of get started. Um, for example, the last bullet point under records management, say, we said, do you need to validate information from off-chain off sources before hashing the information to the blockchain? So we've talked about some of these. You've got compliance questions. Um, do you have access, if, say, for the, the last um, bullet, do you need to establish provenance of the off-chain information before hashing the information to the blockchain? So you have some of those examples. If you look at, for example, business impact analysis, which is the fourth column, um, do you understand the specific recovery time objectives and recovery point objectives from, from, from a backup perspective? So anybody that does backups, you'll understand that. Big thing which gets missed many times is do you have buy-in from the board and senior management level committees for the actual business impact analysis report? You know, many times this is done, it's, you spend a lot of money and just sits on a shelf someplace. So, so those were some of the implementation risks, but so what you have here is kind of a risk assessment matrix. So obviously you've got your four implementation risks for governance. So you know, you'd assign a priority to those risks, you'd probably assign somebody on the team to manage those risks, plus certain audit uh, activities such as objectives of the audit, the audit controls, the type of audit, the audit classification, and the frequency. So these are fairly common audit activities. Um, this is not meant to be an audit framework by, by no stretch of the imagina imagination, but certainly you know, these are things that should be considered um, when you're looking at it from, from an audit perspective. Uh, let's maybe take one more example. So what you see here are the operational risks for the blockchain architecture, and some of these have been covered. So again, do you want to use permission versus permissionless? You know, so for example, as the last bullet, does the permissionless blockchain solution have the capacity to scale up as transaction volumes increase? Um, you know, then again, you look at on-premise versus cloud-based. Uh, you look at blockchain as a service versus a, a proprietary blockchain. A consensus protocol is very critical. So if you look at the second bullet, uh, do you want to do a proof of work um, or a delegated proof of stake consensus algorithm? And of course, that's important because one uh, may not be able to handle um, high volumes as well as, as, as the other. Uh, mining architecture, uh, again, uh, there are questions to consider in terms of the ability to perhaps um, handle um, increasing volumes. So these are just some examples of questions that should be asked from an Sorry, from an operational perspective, meaning the level four risks. 
So again, uh, the same type of um, question should be asked. So in this case, we had uh, five implementation risk areas. And so again, the risk priority, who's going to manage the risk, and again, the types of audit activities that, that one should carry out. So the purpose of this um, matrix is, again, to be able to map each of the implementation risks back up to the, sorry, the operation risks back up to the implementation, back to the design, and be able to be able to then obviously determine where the organization needs to focus its attention and its energy. So in, in conclusion, I think um, blockchain DLT does represent a lot of opportunities, but as with any technology, I think there are risks. And really, I think it's, um, the, I mean, the, the technologies do sometimes fail, uh, but not because of the technology itself, but I think because of not understanding the, the technology's risks and its benefits. So therefore, the initial hype has to be tempered with a proper risk benefits assessment before committing the organization to this direction. And uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. I hear my contact details, and I'll turn it over to uh, Andrew. All right, thank you very much. Um, you know, at this time, uh, we do have uh, moments for questions here. And there is a question here uh, posed by uh, Andrew. Uh, looks like Andrew Kremtovsky, PI could be held on chain without contradicting privacy laws. And he's wondering how is that possible? Question is located in the chat window. I'll jump in. Um, I agree with Natasha and Andrew. Natasha, if I recall correctly, you're a lawyer in Russia, right? And so um, you're right. If there is specific law supporting the use of a blockchain that meets XYZ uh, considerations for holding PII, then of course it could be legally done. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have law that necessarily supports that, or at least that deals with the conflict between privacy law and um, um, for example, we do have evidence law in Arizona about blockchain. But as far as I know, we don't have any laws that specifically provide that for that in North or in Canada and the United States at this point. But if someone knows otherwise, I'd be more than happy to hear that. Excellent. Thank you, Dara. Anyone else want to jump in or do we have any other further questions? You're welcome. All right, uh, Dr. Franks, you want to put in some closing remarks here? If we can get you. I'd like to uh, thank everyone for attending today. Uh, I really appreciate it. We had quite a, a large group. Uh, also, make sure that you uh, visit uh, the uh, 3D PDF Consortium uh, link. Uh, Amitab had mentioned the white paper that was published in January, and uh, you will see much more information about the uh, risks and the audits that Amitab just pulled some sections out of that white paper to illustrate today. But there is much more information there. There as well. Uh, there is another question in the chat window from John. Well, that's quite interesting. I had not thought about that. Uh, seasonality issues, federal holidays, are infrastructures at risk? Uh, I imagine that would be the same as with any other technology uh, that uh, we're trying to protect from uh, uh, adverse uh, uh, influence or partners there. But does anybody have a comment on that? Pari, you work in government. What do you think? I mean, I think that it depends on the type of blockchain that is being used. If if it is a public blockchain, I think that there could be more of a risk involved in it. If it's a private blockchain within the government, there might not be uh, any more risk than any of the other systems that we have. Yeah, hi, this is Amtah um, here. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, mostly these systems are designed to really run, um, you know, 24 by, by 7. Um, obviously, there are regular main test windows. Um, so depending on the type of blocks chain, architecture one chooses, um, those things should be part of the architecture design. Um, so, so, you know, 
holidays don't really affect the availability of, of, that, of that type of blockchain technology. Any other questions or just comments, things that you've been thinking about that we haven't touched on? Okay, then I, lots of miners could be using the same cloud. Cloud goes down, blockchain is in peril. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank everyone. Uh, it's past our time here. I, I appreciate your attending. And uh, if you have any questions for any of us, you see our email addresses and on the screen there. Just grab them and get in touch with us. Thank you, everyone.